all for being here tonight. Um, we have, just bear with me one moment here. Sorry, there we go. Okay, so, so tonight with us, we have families that have uh, made their decision about attending FDU and some families that have not yet made their decision uh, about attending FDU. Uh, FDU. So um, for you know, either group, uh, this, is, this is a important session for you because you have questions uh, and we have answered. Uh, answers and uh, I, I do want to welcome everybody that ha that has committed to FDU and say welcome to the FDU family. And and if you have not yet, if you have not yet made your decision, let me just mention. And this is often uh, a question that's asked of us: um, Is it too late? Have I missed the deadline? Uh, and the answer is no. We're we're not imposing any kind of a harsh deadline. We are working with families, and we want to give families uh, enough time uh, to work with us, to work with yourselves, to make sure that you're comfortable in your decision. Hence, we're having this session tonight to help. Uh, help you make that decision uh, in terms of your college choice. So uh, with that said, uh, I, what I'd like to do is just quickly have our panel introduce themselves. Uh, and immediately after that, we're going to hear from our vice president, going to say a few remarks, and then we're going to basically go over many of the questions that uh, you guys have submitted to us over the course of the last several days. So uh, just, just to go around the room, let me just start in no particular order, which is who I see first, Megan, Megan Troy. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Troy. I'm an undergraduate admissions counselor. I've been with Fairleigh Dickinson for the last five years, and I'm happy and excited to see you all here tonight. Okay, Dennis. Hi, folks. I'm Dennis Green. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions. Um, I've been with the university. It's going on my fourth year now. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Miguel? Cool. Good after good evening. Uh, my name is Vidal Lopez. I'm the Dean of Students at the Metropolitan Campus. I've been with FDU for about 10 years. Um, I oversee student life, uh, residence life, our orientation process, um, conduct, to mention a few of the, of the jobs and responsibilities that my office has. Welcome. Okay, and Vidal is one of two Dean of Students with us tonight, Vidal of, of uh, our Metropolitan Campus and Robin. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Robin Williamson. I'm the Dean of Students on the Florham campus, and um, I'm a, a real veteran of FDU. I just finished my first year. So um, I, I say that joking, but it really has felt like home. Uh, like Vidal mentioned, uh, Dean of Students, we see a lot of things that happen outside of the classroom. So in, on my campus, in my area, I work with our campus life, which is like student life, student clubs and orgs. I work with our Greek life. I work with housing and residence life. I work with our counseling and psychological services, our health services, and then other Dean of Students areas that, where we basically help students uh, be successful. So it's a real honor and privilege to be part of this panel and to welcome you to the FDU community. Great, thank you. And Renee? Hi everyone, <clears throat> my name is Renee Volak. I'm the University Director of Financial Aid here at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Um, I oversee financial aid on all of our campuses. I've been with FDU, it was five years in April, but I have about a 28 year history in financial aid, so. Wonderful, and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Luke Schulteis. Uh, Dr. Schulteis is a Vice President for Enrollment Planning and Effectiveness. He also wears the hat of fearless leader. He's been uh, steering the ship for us over these last very, very difficult and trying times, but he's been doing a marvelous job and we're thrilled to have him with us tonight to kind of lead off and uh, welcome you, uh, provide some remarks about uh, FDU and what we're looking like come this fall. Thank you, Drew, thank you. And thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, sorry we can't see more of you. You've reverted to uh, showing your names only, but, but that's, uh, that's fine, feel free to to show us your faces, if you like. I've uh, I've been here about uh, nearly three years, um, and was at uh, prior to this Michigan State University, Virginia Commonwealth University, and University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, so, what I'd like to share uh, initially with you is uh, the scope of our planning and where we are, because when a, a lot of the questions were submitted, a lot of them had to do with uh, what's going to go on in the fall. Uh, so I'm going to kind of talk at you for a few minutes uh, before we're able to engage in the questions just to hopefully answer uh, to the best that we're able to at this point in time a number of the questions you've posed. And thank you for doing that. We find it, uh, it it's critically important that we engage each other. 
Um, five nights a week, uh, the president, the provost, who's the vice president for academics, uh, our chief financial officer, and uh, myself meet. Uh, so we've been doing that every single night for, for quite some time, as you can imagine now. Uh, we'll be pleasantly, uh, um, I guess, pleased when, when we don't need to do this anymore. But um, the idea behind these daily meetings is there's so much new information that's coming into us. It's really critical that we're able to get together and, uh, and share our viewpoints and what's going on in the industry from the experts we know as well as our peers so that we can then go back to our constituencies that, that we work with and, uh, and help them continue to plan and let them know what, what we're able to think about moving forward. At this stage, there's, there is a framework of, of planning that we're, uh, we're able to embrace and move along with, but there are a lot of details uh, that we don't know the answers to yet. And, and while I know it appears that several institutions have, have gone forward and said we're going to be doing this, I can assure you, Whatever they've planned is not gonna go according to, to how they've outlined it at this point, because there are so many things we need to wait on uh, from, from experts in the, uh, in the health departments, uh, as well as in our, uh, our legislative and executive branches. So we're, we're awaiting guidance on a number of things, but with that said, we're planning a number of different scenarios. So we expect this might be reasonable, so we'll make this plan, it might be this other way, so we'll make that plan. So as you can, as you can imagine, it's it's a lot of work uh, every day to try to figure out how to position yourself. We uh, had a task force for uh, academic delivery and calendar development. This was led by the provost and members of our faculty. Um, and so the professors and, and the vice president of academics met uh, a number of times and have worked at an academic calendar that I'll share with you now. Um, we are going to be uh, modifying uh, our, what we'd call our normal uh, academic calendar and starting a week early. So we're going to be starting classes on Monday, August 17th. And those first three weeks of class will be delivered online exclusively. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Classes in person will begin Tuesday, September 8th, the day after Labor Day. And then we're going to end the semester on Tuesday, November 24th, which is the Tuesday just prior to Thanksgiving. Um, we have sent an email of, of the, our president's announcement of this to, to um, hopefully you all received it. Uh, if not, um, we'd be happy to, but, but check your email boxes. The two places to find this type of information that we deliver it by email. And we also post these updates on our, uh, our main webpage. There'll be a yellow banner up top that says COVID update. So these things will be there so you don't need to worry about writing them down. Why did we make those decisions as an institution? We, um, we, we wanted to compress the fall semester initially so that students could end their instruction by Thanksgiving time. Uh, the, the caution we were uh, looking at there was we didn't want students to leave the campus, go back to, you know, our wonderful Thanksgiving activities, which have, uh, you know, family, friends, who knows who's there. And then if there was uh, uh, another spike of the coronavirus, uh, bring that back on the campus uh, before leaving again for Christmas. So the idea there is this is out of safety and precaution. Let's try to get all the students wrapped up. Uh, just before Thanksgiving, so at that point they can go home and um, and and not need to worry about returning and and um, and bringing back any potential infections. Why are we starting the first three weeks online? We realize that many of you may have made plans. Uh, hopefully, the the things open up in a safe way, and uh, and students may have some travel plans or things of that nature. So we wanted to be sensitive to that, and and start off with the classes being delivered online. We're also doing that just in case. And the just in case is if something happens uh, in society and, uh, and our governor says there needs to be another lockdown, we wanted all the students to be ready in the mode that they were started off with to be able to continue instruction rather than start off on campus and then they go back home. Or, or suddenly we say, surprise, you know, you had plans to come and, and now you need to start off online. So that's the thinking behind that. At this point in time, we are imagining, we haven't committed to this, but what, what's in our heads is that students 
can begin to move on to campus by uh, Monday, uh, August 17th, and then take those classes online for the first couple of uh, first three weeks. That's our, that's our thinking right now. We haven't worked out yet a move in plan. We haven't figured out how we're going to stage that uh, because we don't want all the students to arrive at once, but I can assure you that we're thinking about it. So uh, that's, that's kind of the kickoff with classes and the academic calendar. I'll also share a byproduct of this, which I think is pretty exciting, is now we're going to have more or less the whole month of December where students aren't on campus, we'll have the ability to have them in, a, in an expanded winter term. So that will be online for certain. And this is not a required term. You know, fall and spring would be the, the normal two semesters. But we've always had a very small winter term, and now we're going to have a larger one in which we're going to offer more classes. And we're looking at, again, we, we're not 100% certain, but I'm pretty sure uh, we'll be extending some uh, special pricing on the courses during that winter term just to encourage students to get ahead. And uh, what we've done this summer is we've uh, discounted summer classes where a student can take the first class at the regular tuition rate and then the subsequent classes at half rate. And just so you're aware, if your students wanted to jump onto our summer th three term, they can do that even though they haven't started in the fall yet. They're actually FDU students now and they are entitled to take, take a class. So we thought that was a great benefit. Uh, it can save you some money and help the students get ahead. We all want our students to graduate in four years and anything we can do to expedite that is, is where we wanna be. I wanna talk with you uh, for a couple of minutes about an additional task force, and, and several members of the panel are on that task force. Uh, it's called the Task Force for Campus, Re Campus Reoccupancy and Operations. Uh, and so I'm gonna read to you a, a few things about what they're focusing on. And, and what I wanna express um, is that we don't have the answers to these things yet, but we're working on them, uh, as all institutions are. No one's got the answers to all of these yet because again, we haven't received the appropriate guidance, but we're working on a number of scenarios. This task force has been charged with developing and continuously refining and implementing a plan and policies for us to safely reoccupy and operate the campuses. So there's some guidelines built into that. There's some parameters. It needs to conform to current regulatory and best practice guidance. And we're engaged with other institutions, with professionals, with, with different uh, specialists on that. It's gonna include uh, examining how we reoccupy all of the spaces, but just to call them out, classrooms, labs, libraries, residence halls, our dining facilities, athletic and recreational facilities, offices, restrooms, and all the common areas indoors and outdoors. And as you can imagine, this, this means developing different traffic patterns, numbers of people we can have in spaces, how we're gonna integrate social distancing and, and, and all those sorts of things. So it's pretty complex while we're creating the plan. Um, what's also entailed is including uh, is uh, behavioral changes that we're gonna need to implement. So uh, there, there will be ways in which you know, we're, we're able to have people come in and out of buildings and perform certain activities in, in different ways than they're used to, just out of, again, an abundance of caution and safety. We need to procure and monitor necessary testing, contract tracing resources, as well as personal protective equipment. So we're working on plans on how are we gonna trace, how are we gonna test students, faculty, staff, uh, what's the regularity with which we need to do that? What are the best types of tests? And I, I'll share some of the feedback I've heard from members of the task force. There are some crazy tests. There are all sorts of things scientists are coming up with aside from the, you know, the swab type thing. There are a lot of different ways. So we, we need to figure out as an institution, as in an in educational sector, what's the best way to do this, right? That's, that's our primary concern. How do we trace? which is gonna include working with the health department and how do we distribute and, and on what regular, regularity of basis protective equipment on a personal basis. We need to secure isolation and quarantine space on campus. So we need to have spaces if someone does come down uh, with the virus, how are we gonna put them into a safe space where they can continue to receive their education and, and uh, get able to get better as well as not spread it. 
We're working on planning our hygiene uh, regulations, security checkpoints, signage and communication. This is um, quite unlike, uh, you know, the you, you go to a store today and some stores enforce things, some don't. People act in all sorts of different ways. This isn't going to be the, su the supermarket. This is going to be, it's really crystal clear. This is what people need to do, how they're going to do it. Uh, it's super easy to understand. And this is going to be the culture here. And again, it's to support the, the safety of, of everybody. We'll provide hygiene guidelines, uh, develop an enhanced cleaning procedure, and a social distancing policy. So that's what the group is working on. So we don't have answers to those issues yet, but those are the issues that, that are being worked on quite diligently. So as we develop answers to these, we will communicate them to you through email and on our COVID uh, uh, portion of the main website. So a few questions associated with, uh, with uh, some of those things. When can students move in? We think some students can start moving in August 17th. We're not sure how many yet. It's being worked on. There's, we're talking about this. We just aren't sure how we're gonna do it yet, but we're developing the plan. So stay tuned to it, but that's our, that's, that's our plan is to try to be able to have everyone who needs to be on campus there as quickly as possible, but as safely as possible. Um, what will housing look like? We don't know yet. Um, we're developing a plan whereby every unit will be a single unit, but we're receiving some additional guidance that there are different models for this, where two students, or maybe a couple more, we don't know yet, right? We're, we're waiting for the scientists. If two students live in a dorm room together, they're considered almost as a family. And I can see some neat benefits of that. They can eat together, they can you know, hang out together and, and, and live together, and that's a, a really exciting experience. Uh, but we're not certain of that yet. So as soon as we know, we'll share that information. Um, are there going to be limited resources? No, we're not limiting our resources. In fact, this has provided us, I believe, with a real exciting opportunity to enhance. So coming into the semester, we're going to have uh, all sorts of different, different ways to provide support to the students. So the provost has been having all of the faculty undergo significant training in the delivery of online courses, uh, not through a format like this. This is something we all kind of jumped on at the end of last semester because it was quick and easy and, 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 and we could get it done. But there are different tools, there are different platforms we can use, and we're training our faculty on that so that the learning experience is dynamic. Um, I will share with you, this is really important to me, uh, not as a professional, but as a father. Uh, my daughter's enrolling this semester for fall at Florham, and she's taking a summer class. And I gotta tell you, there's nothing better than having a spy because she can bring back to me her needs, you know, what, what, what's going on well, what was a challenge, and then we're able to address it. And we'll want that from you too, as things move along. The more information we get, the better. Um, but I can assure you a lot of efforts going into providing a wonderful academic experience. Outside of the academic experience is the, uh, the, the student life, the extracurricular experience. And, and while we've got our two deans of students who are the experts on that, and I'll leave questions to, for them to answer, I can tell you we're working with some vendors on some enhanced um, remote activities where people can do things in a really cool way without having to be on top of each other. But student life's gonna happen. It's gonna be exciting, it's gonna be dynamic, and it's, it's gonna be special. And this is a point in time and when we've really begun to look at ourselves and say, what more can we do for students? And let's do that. And then when things come back to normal, whenever that is, we'll be able to do all of that. And, and that'll be really a beautiful thing for our students. Um, Tuition. Oh boy, I've got good news for you. So uh, today was our second day of our board meeting. And all of the financial aid packages you've received were based upon what we anticipated our tuition to be this coming fall. And the tuition we anticipated for this coming fall was a 2% increase over what it was last fall. And that's just, we, do, we, we just built in that assumption to be able to deliver a package to you that we felt would be close to where the tuition would, would end up to help with your planning. The board of trustees and the, um, and the officers of the university have unanimously agreed that we're not gonna increase the tuition from last year. So you're gonna see a reduction in the tuition that we, we had initially uh, been assigning to you 
and we'll help communicate that with you through some packaging and our director of financial aid is, is here with us. But um, that hasn't been announced yet because you were so gracious to participate in this, uh, you, you get to be the first in the know. So I think that's uh, really exciting. We are, um, again, we're gonna provide a full cadre of services. Um, room and board's gonna be really high quality. I can assure you that we haven't mapped out the cleaning patterns or how we're gonna do, take care of food and things, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be first class, all right? However it needs to be. Um, so uh, I, I wanna assure you of that. Um, finally, I just wanna provide to you um, a, a personal but also a collective commitment on behalf of the university and the other panelists. Um, we're here for you. Uh, this is very important to us. Uh, we build ourselves as personal global transformational and, uh, and I think you'll see that come through. You'll be provided with our contact information at the end of this session and, and please feel very, very free to take advantage of that. We want to be able to answer questions for you uh, to ensure you have a comfort level with where things are going and, and you have a, a full body of knowledge, so you're, you're comfortable. Um, with that said, I think I'll, uh, I'll turn it back to you, Drew, or Dennis, uh, to, to proceed with the rest of the meeting. Okay, and thank you, Dr. Schultz. I appreciate those comments, very helpful. Um, and hi again, everybody. Um, and uh, as uh, Dennis just put up a note uh, into the, in the chat room, uh, if you have questions over the course of the session, please feel free to jot them down. We'll collect them. We have collected quite a few questions. I'm sorry? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, we have collected quite a few uh, questions early when you, when you registered, which was great, which kind of guided uh, some of the comments that you've heard so far. So we're going to be going through those. Dennis is going to be kind of my right-hand man here and uh, uh, kind of ask the questions of the panel and get you guys the answers that, that you need. I just wanted to, just prior to turning it over to Dennis, just repeat the question I, I, I asked earlier in my opening remarks. Uh, some people to join us a little, little bit after that, but a common question that we get is, uh, is it too late to, to deposit? Um, and again, the, an the answer is, is no. While, while FDU did, imp we, we did provide an extended deadline of June 1st, it was always a soft deadline. There was never any 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 hard push uh, to get you guys to commit until you were ready. That is part of of our commitment to you. We are going to work with you for as long as it takes. Hopefully, it won't take long, and hopefully tonight will be helpful in that regard. But for those families that have not yet committed, if you need more time, you have, you have more time. Uh, there is an advantage to getting your, everything in order and making your decision because there are some next steps that you want to uh, follow follow up on, such as registering for orientation meet your advisors, we do the class schedule, these things you want to get done enough in advance as possible to put that behind you, relax, and enjoy the remaining days of summer until we get to August 17th. Uh, but again, if you need more time, we're here. And as, uh, as Dr. Schultz mentioned, at the end of the session, we'll have all of our contact information, and not just us, you, you have at your disposal the entire university. So rest assured on that point. Uh, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Dennis. Hi again, folks. So we, like Drew said, we did collect a lot of your questions that you provided to us during the registration process. Um, well, Luke went through a lot of those um, questions and answered um, them in his remarks. Um, there were a few questions that um, we're going to answer now for you. So I'm going to kind of categorize the questions. So we're going to kind of start off with how with housing and campus life. So we'll be speaking to Robin and Vidal to start off with. So one of the main questions that has been coming up a lot is revolving around orientation. Um, we understand that there's virtual orientation, so families are kind of curious as to what that's gonna look like, and ultimately, if they're gonna have the chance to maybe have a live session where, when it's on campus, when we get back on campus. So Robin, do you wanna kind of discuss how that would be working? Absolutely. So um, Vidal and I and some other colleagues from um, our campuses, even our Vancouver campus, we've been working on different ways to provide orientation information to incoming students since we can't host you on campus. So for the Florham campus, and obviously I'll share with Vidal, he can speak about what's going on on the Metro campus. Um, but on the Florham campus, 
Uh, we have um, our 20 orientation leaders who are actively reaching out to those students who have already deposited. So if you're on the call and your student has deposited, they should be receiving an email uh, from their orientation leader to both their personal email address as well as their student FDU email address. And we will engage with your student on a weekly basis for the rest of the summer because we know that they're not getting the typical orientation experience where they get to come and meet different students students and meet the upper class student leaders who serve as our orientation leaders. So we want to make sure that um, y'all feel confident and excited about joining our communities. And then in addition to reaching out um, and connecting with the orientation leaders, we have an online orientation module. So again, your students, um, if they have deposited, uh, they are receiving a link to do an online orientation module. And it's got great information on there. It takes what's on the website and what our um, departments and offices would normally give during an orientation session and, and boils it down into some really meaningful bite-sized chunks of information that um, that you'll need to know before you start in the fall. And then in addition to that, we have our online synchronous virtual orientation days and on the Florham campus we have four days to choose from two at the end of June two at the beginning of July and during that day the students will have a chance to meet other new students we're going to do small breakout rooms uh, in zoom they'll have a chance to have a coffee break with faculty and just start to talk with faculty because one of the things that I love most about FDU is that our faculty not only are they expert teachers but they are genuinely caring human beings who really are interested in students and want to help them succeed. Um, they'll also get a chance to learn about College 101, what it means to be a college student, and then they'll get to end the day with um, meeting with academic advisors to talk about the advising process. And for the family members, uh, we haven't forgotten you, but we know that things can get a little, little wonky sometimes when everybody's using the Wi-Fi at the same time, or if you, um, you've been fortunate to go back to work and, and get out of the shelter in place. So we will be providing a series of programs for parents and families in the evening, starting in July, on different topics that families tend to have a lot of questions about. So for example, what does the Dean of Students Office really do and how do we serve your students and meet your needs? Um, we're going to have a panel about mental health. Um, obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty going on. And, and for those students who are traditional high school age, maybe they missed out on those rites of passage, um, prom, a real graduation in person. And so we want to make sure that we, we give you information about how we can best support your students as they transition into college life. And there'll be other opportunities for other topics to be discussed as well. And you will also get your own online module. Um, so you'll have an opportunity to see what the modules look like and have a chance to have that same information. And again, it comes alongside what's already on our website, but it boils it down so that way you really understand what you need to know to start the fall off on on the right foot. Thank you, Robin. Videl, was there anything that you would like to add, especially for the Metro side? Okay, Did, no one had anything. <laughs> um, I echo uh, Robin's excitement. We're very excited to meet the parents, meet the students. Um, I just wanted to say that at Metro, we have three days of orientation for students and three days for parents. Um, again, we also will have meetings with parents, ongoing meetings with parents before and after orientation, just to answer any questions that you, you may have. Um, and once we come on campus, we'll do a modif modified orientation to get students acclimated to the campus, to the resources, to the buildings, classrooms, et cetera. And we'll have um, our OLs, our orientation leaders working with the students and the parents all year round. Perfect, perfect. And just to clarify with everyone, um, this in-person option will be available on both campuses. Is that correct, Videl? Yes. Once they arrive on campus. Perfect, perfect. So, um, Videl, could you talk to us a little bit about the roommate selection? There's been a few questions about how people can select a roommate. Well, uh, students will have an opportunity to go online. Um, we do have um, My Housing app. Um, where students, it's a port, my housing portal, I'm sorry. Students are able to go in and if they don't have a roommate, they could choose a roommate uh, using the roommate search tool. Um, sometimes uh, students already know who they want to room with. They could search for that individual in the roommate search uh, tool 
and find that person and submit that to the housing um, staff and they will be able to put the students together. If you're not sure, but you want someone that has some, some similarities with you, some same interests, such as not smoking, um, um, you're in the same major, you could also look for someone that has some of those um, um, stats and, 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 and they'll match you with that, with that person. Perfect, thank you. Um, and there's a number of questions about the overall social distancing. Um, and how that's going to affect the fall semester when students actually get back on campus. So whether you, Vidal or Robin, could you give us some, maybe some examples of what you're planning for the fall, especially with like campus life? Sure. So I think um, one of the things that we've been talking about is finding ways that we can bring students together in community, but obviously meeting uh, governor guidance and and also social distancing guidelines so for example we've talked about holding a drive a drive-in movie where we plot out six by six plots on the library lawn and students can sit and and like dr schulteis mentioned there are some models out there that roommates can be considered a familial unit and so maybe the the familial units get their own little six by six plot but we get to still be in community with one another while still maintaining social distancing guidelines. Um, one of the things that is really popular on the Florham campus is bingo. Our Florham programming committee, once a month they do bingo and they have a DJ and they give out really great prizes. And so one of the things that we're looking at is normally we do it in the cafeteria and we kind of scrunch them all together and have a lot of fun, but we maybe we move to the gym and we sit six feet apart, but we still get to be together. We get to play bingo. We get to listen to great music and win great prizes. So, you know, again, it's, it's having us think differently about the way that we're doing our events, but at the heart of it all is about how do we give students the opportunity to feel a part of our community. And so whether that's in an online Zoom call like this, where we can see each other through the screen, but we still see each other, um, whether it's we take reservations for different times to keep the group size small, um, or we, we're outside and we're enjoying six feet apart from one another. Um, we are working with our staff and our student leaders and our student organizations to think about, again, how do we help students, all students, but especially our new students, start to feel connected and engaged in our community? Excellent. Thank you, Robin. Vidal, is there anything that you want to add, especially for the Metro campus in particular? You know, as Robin stated, we're brainstorming on some programming that's it's still exciting to students. Um, a lot of online programming, we're hearing from a lot of schools that are doing different things, and we're brainstorming and putting the programs together. Yes, there will be a limited amount of students, but we want to do the same type of programs, but in a safe manner, right? We want to keep our students safe, but still interacting and still being part of our community. Um, and that's what's most important to us, that they have fun, that they integrate themselves to the university, to the programming, but still be safe. Thank you. Um, and we, we just need some clarification. So um, Luke, if there, it could, if you could go into a little, like just talk about the university's plan for housing, whether it's the singles or the doubles and ultimately how that decision is gonna be made. There's a number of questions regarding that. Yeah, thanks again. We're we're not um, we're not certain at this point. So our initial plans are are going with singles, uh, but we've got a number of things to look at, including the pricing and and just uh, we want to do the right things by the students. So there's going to be a little more a little more uh, time we need. Uh, a lot of it's based going to be based upon the guidance we receive. If if we can have more than one student in a room, um, generally speaking, you enjoy that. Uh, it makes the experience pretty rich. Uh, so, so we're not certain um, at this point, but it's being very seriously examined, I assure you. And a follow-up question, Luke. There's a lot of questions about sports. Um, could you give us a little insight as to what the university has planned for Division One and Division Three sports? Uh, sure. Um, we are uh, awaiting guidance from the NCAA and our, our relative, uh, our, our respective conferences. Um, we're not certain yet. There, there may be some sports uh, that become active and some don't. We just don't know the answer to that. Um, and I do know, I'm aware, you know, so the Big Ten football conferences are, are getting out there to do their thing and, and who knows how that's going to work out. So we're really awaiting guidance on that. And the coaches are all very eager. What I can say, um, 
my daughter's on the uh, going to be on the volleyball team at Florham, and the coach is engaging the student. She's made great friends through social media already, not just on the team, but from across campus. She's she's selected someone she wants to be her roommate based on this. She's never actually met the person in person, uh, and the team is practicing. Um, so they're they're doing things remotely. So uh, so Michelle is you know, exercising when the coach says exercise and, and doing all sorts of things. So there's a lot up in the air, but in the meantime, the coaches are being really engaging uh, and, uh, and they're trying to keep all their athletes in good shape. And, and we're all very hopeful, but we just don't know what lies ahead for us yet. But that's, that's where we are today. Thank you. Um, so just to move on a little bit, um, we can always come back to campus life and housing, but there are a number of questions regarding financial aid. So I'm gonna bring Renee into the mix. Um, Renee, could you talk to us a little bit about the financial aid process, especially if someone has not filled out a FAFSA at this point? Sure. So it's not too late. Um, the FAFSA is uh, the free application for federal student aid, and you can fill out the FAFSA at any point during a, st a student's enrollment. Of course, we encourage you to fill it out now so that you can have financial aid information to make good decisions and plan, um, but it, it really is available at any point. Um, I know that there was some concern because um, the tax filing deadline date has been moved up in, to July and several people or a lot of people have not filed their taxes, but the current, currently the FAFSA relies on two years um, ago income. I didn't say that very well, but uh, prior, prior year is what we call it. So normally you would have put your 2019 income when 2019 ended, and that was what would have been put on this year's FAFSA. But a handful of years ago, the Department of Education changed those rules, and it's two years prior. So when you fill out your FAFSA now, you would be filling it out with 2018's income. So I'm assuming that most people have filed their income taxes for, for 2018. So you don't need to worry about the fact that you may not have filed yet for this current um, tax year. So that's helpful. Once you file your financial aid application, um, your FAFSA, one of the things that you do on the FAFSA is you indicate uh, the school you'd like that information sent to. So after you would be one of those schools, if you're interested in coming in, uh, and being with us, and we'll receive that information. It takes a few days, anywhere from a few days to a week for that information to be processed at the federal processor and sent to us. We upload that information, we prepare a package for you. In years past, we would have sent you a paper package. Some of you out there may have a paper package if you applied early and have deposited with us already or not. But when we had to move to our processes remotely, we were no longer able to uh, send paper packages. So we're sending you PDFs. It's what you would have gotten in paper, only it's in a PDF form. And we're sending it to the email address uh, that you have on file with our admissions office. So that's where the, the package is going. And it's basically a picture of what you would have gotten in paper. So it's gonna be a letter. Um, it's going to be the actual awards. There is going to be a, a college planning sheet and if you've applied to any other schools, you'll notice you got a similar thing. Uh, the state of New Jersey implemented that this year. So that gives you a better idea of uh, apples to apples comparison between colleges. And that's what you're going to receive in the package. Um, once you receive the package, we really encourage everybody to contact the office with, not, with any kind of questions or to discuss it. Um, we're happy to do that. In fact, we like to do that. We want to make sure that you're really understanding what it is you're looking at what the various awards mean, how they affect your bottom line, and what, if anything, remains to be paid. So we're anxious to help you with that. And um, we're there for, for you anytime you need to talk to us about those things. So. Renee, could you quickly um, describe the process for families who may have been affected by the COVID-19 crisis? Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you have some COVID related issues that may be affecting your ability to pay or to come uh, to FDU, we want you to talk to us about that. There's a couple of different things that we can do for you. Uh, one thing that we can do is we can take a look at your special circumstances and we can um, take a look at those circumstances and recalculate your aid based on what your current financial circumstances are. Not to get too deep into the weeds, but the Department of Education calls that a professional judgment income review. 
And we're happy to do that. And when we do that, we'll look at you for additional federal and state aid, but we also use that as a basis to see if you are eligible for any additional institutional aid from Fairleigh Dickinson. So that's one thing you most definitely can do. Um, and we'll help you out with that. Uh, the other thing is we just ask you to give us a call and tell us if you have any um, COVID related expenses. We may, we have some emergency funds. We have some things that we may be able to do to help you with that. They're limited, but we found that it's been very useful. Sometimes it doesn't take too much to help somebody with some of those things to get them over the, the, the gap so that they can uh, join us. So those are the two basic things that we do. Um, you'll be paired up with a financial aid counselor who uh, you'll work with continually. The hope is that you'll continue to work with them once you're here. We like to pair you with someone so that you know they know your story, you're comfortable with them. You don't have to work with the same person every time, but if you wish to, um, that, that is the way that we have it set up so that you're comfortable with that. And they'll walk you through the process. They'll tell you what documents you need to submit to the office, what information we need from you, and whatever next steps are required, so. Um, and Renee, for families that go through this process for the secondary financial review, how quick do we turn around those answers? Um, that's a little difficult to say. We, we try to do it as quickly as possible. What sometimes happens is we may ask you for a series of documents, some information, and sometimes that leads to us needing to ask for additional documentation or further explanation. Um, these are a priority for us. We know, especially this time of year, how important this is. So this is definitely a priority for us. I mean, we, this is when we have the information, it goes, we begin to work on it as soon as we have it. Uh, I have counselors whose job is to just do that. That's a big part of what they do in my office. So um, it's, we try to turn those around as quickly as possible. I'm sorry, I can't give you more of a definitive answer but it just all depends on, on what documents we need. Sometimes the analysis takes a little bit longer than others, but um, I do rest assured that this is um, a job that we have dedicated staff uh, attending to. And this may be a question for you, Renee, but when would families expect to get their bills for the coming semester? So um, normally bills are sent out right in the second or third week of July. My understanding, because things are up in the air this year, is there will be, the bills will go out a little bit later, and consequently, the bill due, due date will be later as well. So um, that's gonna be pushed back. I wish, uh, like, just like Dr. Schulteis, I can't tell you exactly, they're working on that. Part of the reason we don't know is because of some of the things that Dr. Schulteis uh, um, was referencing, we don't, know how that's going to affect billing, like housing, for instance, when will students get on campus? What will that? So these are things that affect, directly affect billing. And so that's why I can't keep you, give you a definitive answer. I will tell you it will be later than normal. The bills will go more than likely go out later than the second week of July, but also the due date for those bills will be pushed back as well. Thank you, Renee. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna hop over to Megan and ask her a few questions. Um, so, Megan, can you talk to us about the schedules, especially for our first year students coming in? How does that work? Sure. So, for all of our students who have chosen their majors, hopefully you're really excited about those. Um, during orientation, you generally will meet with academic advisors who are going to help you choose out your classes for the term. Um, every degree program has a set list of classes that you're going to have to take. Um, outside of knowing how many people are going to be in your class, um, they're going to be able to tell you which classes you need for your semester, which classes are going to be prerequisites for your major. Um, they'll help you with all of that. If you have any college credits or AP scores, um, that's important to get to the admissions office because that also will help determine which classes you might need to take for the fall and the spring semester of your freshman year. So definitely make sure we're getting all of your transcripts if you've taken classes at a local college while you were in high school, or even if you're taking some over the summer with us or with someone else, make sure we have those transcripts. Um, so all of your classes, they're kind of set for you already. We're gonna go through and see which classes you need. And then once you're meeting with your advisors, they'll tell you exactly which classes you'll take. And then of course, times and whether they'll be online versus uh, in person when we are doing our face-to-face -face classes, that's also something that will be determined then. And Megan, can you talk to us for any of the transfer students that we have on board? Sure, absolutely. So 
transfers are usually my favorite. Um, I've worked with them for the last four years. You guys are awesome. Um, so for the transfer students, it's kind of the same. It's very important that you get your final transcripts to FDU as soon as possible. Um, I know there might be a little bit of a lag since a lot of universities don't have someone physically on campus, but as soon as your final grades for the spring semester or summer, if you're taking summer classes before you start, make sure that you've requested that your final transcript be sent to the university admissions office. Once we have those, they'll be evaluated and then you'll set up, you'll schedule, excuse me, time with your academic departments, a little bit different than the undergraduate freshman students, but our transfer students will meet with someone, whether it's via Zoom or face-to-face -face when we get back to campus, um, to choose out the class that you have remaining on your academic program based off of the courses that have transferred in. Thank you, Megan. And if students are just interested in what courses are required for their program in particular, is there any way that they can find that information out? Absolutely. So one of the easiest ways to do it is on our website. Um, you can go to academics right on the search bar when you get to the front homepage. Um, you would choose your department or your college. Um, so if you're a business student, you'd be looking at Silverman College of Business. Um, so similar to that. Once you get there, you find your academic program and they list majority of your academic coursework right on that screen. Sometimes it's gonna be just your major course requirements. Um, there are general education classes that everyone has to take, but specifically your courses are gonna be listed with your major on the website. Thank you, Megan, those are great answers. Um, so I'm going to ask Drew a few questions. Um, there's lots of questions about the summer courses, Drew. Could you give families some insight as to um, the process for signing up for summer courses before the fall? Right now, so, yes, and summer there are three summer sessions. Unfortunately, one is over, the second one is in process, so that's only leaving summer session three. So unfortunately, there won't be a whole lot of available courses just by the nature of how, how the schedule works, especially as we get, as we get closer. Um, there is, uh, if you go to, um, any students that are interested, if you go to our webpage, and uh, as Becca was just saying, just go to the search bar and type in summer and you'll come up to a summer homepage and there's a link there, which is essentially it's an email address, but what it does is it sends, it sends your request to take a summer class to a, to a group of people that would then work with you individually to see what's available, to see what you're interested in taking, if that could be worked out uh, for the summer. So it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty much just, just that. Uh, but again, the only caveat to that is that uh, we are approaching summer session three and there might be a little bit of a limitation as to what's left at this point. Excellent. Thank you, Drew. Um, and I'm going to, so now at this point, we have a lot of just general questions. So I'll be relaying these to the correct individuals. Um, so one of the questions that we've gotten tonight is um, in regards to students who might be at risk, especially with the COVID-19. Um, so Robin, maybe you want to take this question here. Um, how would that ultimately work if students, for example, um, are required to live on campus or not required if they have the option to live on campus and they're not and they're in a double. Absolutely. So for example, if someone is at higher risk uh, for contracting the coronavirus um, because of underlying health issues, you can apply for a medical single through disability support services. So for example, um, we have students who have asthma, severe asthma. We have had students that have cystic fibrosis. So obviously some pulmonary disorders that would make them very high risk. And so you would submit documentation. It's all kept confidential through Mr. Darshan Shaw on the Florham campus. Uh, he oversees that process. He, um, he looks at the documentation. He looks at the application. And then our housing office works very closely with disability support services. Uh, to ensure that we give students the accommodations that they need. And obviously it's not just for those at risk for COVID. We work with students on a variety of needs that they may require their own bedrooms. Um, so that way they can be healthy and successful. So there is one avenue to do that. Um, if you're just concerned about contracting the virus, um, you certainly can reach out to me or my housing staff. We'd be happy to visit with you and your student, just kind of talk through those individual needs and concerns and, and brainstorm with you on what might be an appropriate um, outcome to that. And Robin, just to follow up on that, there's some questions about health forms, especially since doctors' offices haven't been open this summer. How should parents and students work with that? 
Sure. So if your if your doctor's office hasn't been open, um, then I think one of the things that I would say is you can contact um, the health services directors and just let them know that your doctor's office hasn't been open. Now, if your doctor's office is open, but maybe they're only doing telehealth appointments, um, I would ask your doctor if they would be willing, um, obviously, if you send them a signed release form, if they'd be willing to mail the forms directly to the health centers. Um, I know that both directors of our health centers are, are coming in, they're checking the mail, they're getting those, those health forms and, and releasing those medical holds and creating those charts for all those new students. So um, even if you can't physically go into your doctor's office and um, pick up the documentation yourself, talk to your doctor and see if they'd be willing with a written release from you, if they'd be willing to mail it directly to um, the health centers on either campus. Um, our staff will be happy to receive it. And again, we keep it very confidential. We're in compliance with HIPAA regulations. So the only people who would receive that mail would be those health professionals who abide by those guidelines. Thank you, Robin. So Videl, there's um, some questions about the Latino Promise program. Um, since that's a program that's exclusively at our Metro campus, could you talk about how that program would be affected come this fall? Um, I'm not, I'm not sure that it, it, uh, it will be affected. I think uh, any program on campus, um, we're treating it as, as we would treat any other, any other students. I'm not sure what, um, what the question refers to, how it would be affected. Um, students will continue to be, come in. We're actually reaching out to those students. They are part of our orientation process right now. Um, since um, our modules went live, students have been um, attending our orientation. I do not think that it would be affected um, at all. Um, and again, they're just like any other student that we have um, and we are reaching out to them and making sure that they're following um, all the protocols that any other student will follow as well as again, being part of our regular orientation um, this year. Excellent, thank you, Vidal. Mm -hmm. um, Megan, could you talk to us about our Facebook group? There's some students that are curious as to how, what that group is and the benefits of it. Absolutely. So it's a great way to start meeting some of your classmates. Um, our Admitted Students Facebook page, we have a page for our firm students and another one for our Metropolitan students. It's a great way to meet other students, um, finding out students that are living in the area that you already live in, finding out students that are gonna be in your same major, um, also meeting the admissions team. We're also a part of the Facebook group and we can answer any of your questions that, that might pop up in the middle of the night and you post. Um, we also have a parents page. Uh, you all have received emails about the Facebook page. Even on our admit page on the website, you have access to the link to take you to the Facebook page. I encourage students to join. It's very active. Um, and for those of you who might want a roommate, um, if having a double is available when we start school, that's a great way to meet someone to be your roommate. Um, even though that wasn't something I did when I went to college, I did Facebook my, my roommate to meet her online before we actually got to campus. And that was a really great thing for us. We were able to coordinate some of the things that we were gonna to bring to campus just because we were able to talk to each other. Um, so I would recommend all of the students to log in and get onto our Facebook page and for the parents as well. Um, the admissions team, we are part of both pages. So if you have questions later on, we're able to answer them if you post them in that group. Thank you, Megan. Um, and there were a few people that joined us um, after the opening remarks. Um, so Luke, could you share with us the plans for tuition this coming fall? There's some questions about what tuition is gonna be um, overall for the two campuses. Sure, thanks, thanks again. Um, we had a, a board meeting today and the, um, the board of trustees and the officers have unanimously agreed that especially in light of what's going on and, and the financial difficulties that are, are uh, being faced by so many of us uh, today that we are not going to be increasing the tuition this year. And the packages you've received were built upon a projected increase of 2% over uh, last year's rate. So that's not going to occur. Uh, so you'll be um, uh, being able to, to appreciate a, a, a reduction in the uh, tuition that we were expecting to be charging you. So uh, we're, we're really excited about that. And um, 
we'll be getting uh, getting that information out to you. Thank you. Uh, Drew, there's a question about our EOF program. Um, since the EOF program is now filled on our two campuses, um, when will students know if they're, if they're on the waiting list, if they'll actually get into the program this fall? Right, and yeah, and the answer is very, very soon. And to be completely honest, it's not likely that any more seats in the EOF program will open. That program is filled to capacity at both campuses. Um, I mean, just as another tidbit of information, there's a, like a summer component to that program, which is basically beginning now. So essentially that program is underway. So it's, it's not realistic that we would have any additional seats in EOF. However, I encourage any, any students that were interested uh, in the EOF program, any families to reach out to Renee's office, not for EOF uh, the conversation, but um, you know, essentially there, um, there could be help for you being in a potentially uh, high need scenario as the EOF program would describe it. Um, there, it there's, there are ample funds in the university to assist students with need. Um, so you may be pleasantly surprised to realize that a, a regular package, quote unquote regular uh, package, is quite, uh, is quite full in terms of the different types of, of aid that you would get and could make the, you know, certainly the possibility of attending FDU as realistic as if you were in the EOF program. I realize it doesn't have certain advantages the EOF program has, but uh, as was alluded to a little bit here and there, the university it's just chock full of all kinds of special support services, formally, informally. Uh, if, if there's a need of any kind, personal, uh, professional, academic, uh, in any which way or form, um, financial, there is a place to go to. So bottom line is I would encourage uh, those students interested, interested in the EOF program uh, to talk to Renee's office about alternative financial aid packages that hopefully will make uh, FDU a reality for you. Thank you, Drew. Um, and then there were a few just final questions in regards to depositing. So um, I'll hop over to Megan. I'll have Megan um, answer this question. Megan, can you talk to us about how students can deposit for this fall? And do they have to submit both deposits at the same time if they're going to be a resident student? So for deposits, it's very simple. You go to fdu.edu slash admit and then choose which campus you're going to, the Metropolitan or the Florham. Once you're there, the next steps are available, freshman next steps or transfer next steps, depending on which student you are. The very first option for both of those is gonna be submit your deposit. Um, there's a web link there, you can click there and it'll take you to a payment website. Um, it is important to know that it's a payment website where you have to have your student ID number available. So you should have that when you're ready um, to submit the deposit, because you have to type that in. When it comes to your deposit, your tuition deposit and housing deposit, if you are a resident student, then your total deposit is $550. If you are um, a part of a specialty group, you might have something different that's gonna be on your admissions letter and it'll specify what yours is. Um, currently, they are able to submit the tuition deposit first. If they need to, I recommend contacting the admissions office if that's something you need to do and then submitting your housing deposit at a later time. But again, I recommend contacting the admissions office before doing that to let us know so we can kind of keep track of that student for you. Um, it's important that you do submit your housing deposit because even though we have housing available, it'll still fill up once we know exactly when our students can move on to campus. We have lots of families that are kind of waiting on that information. And once it becomes available, that's gonna be the time where majority of those students are gonna say, okay, yes, since we know we're moving on campus on this date, let me go ahead and submit my deposit so that I, sec I can secure my spot. The housing application comes after that. So it's important, you can't fit submit a housing application if you haven't submitted your housing deposit. So um, I caution you, if you do need to separate those payments to let us know. Um, so of course, we're gonna have our contact information at the end. So just reach out to us and let us know what your situation is and that will make it a little easier for us to help you. Thank you, Megan. Um, and then there is one final question about since the tuition will not be increasing this fall in this academic term, um, Renee, could you um, answer this question if the academic scholarships or if any of the financial aid will be changed because of this um, new development? 
It's not likely that it will happen. Um, there are some rules regarding federal and state aid and with uh, <clears throat> where students are not allowed to have more money than they demonstrate financial need for. But also a cost of attendance budget is comprised of direct and indirect costs, meaning things that we estimate, books, supplies, et cetera. And most of the time, uh, um, there's enough of indirect costs that those averages, it should equal out. The changes that we were putting into the cost of attendance budget, assuming an increase was fairly modest. So um, removing that should be, uh, shouldn't be should reverse your financial aid eligibility much. So it's gonna save you money, but at the same time, I really don't think, I can't promise every single person that that won't happen, but I, um, Every year we have to adjust the cost of attendance budgets and often it's down a little bit, and we don't often see that. So um, I, I, I don't think it's gonna affect very many people, if anyone. Thank you, Renee. So that kind of fields all of our questions that we've had. So I'm going to put up our contact information now. If anyone has any just final questions, we'll answer those and then I'll have um, either Drew or Luke give some final remarks. Yeah, and uh, just my, my only final remark is, uh, is a recommendation, actually. Um, Luke mentioned earlier the communications, the, the various amounts of communications that we're doing via email, which is, you know, uh, for obvious reasons, it's the main way to, to communicate these days. I can only imagine how many emails students are getting, families are getting. Uh, I know how many we send, and I ask you to bear with us because we really mean well, but we do want to communicate with you and make sure that we're sharing important information. So my advice is, if you see an email from FDU, take a quick look at it, give it a few seconds just to open it, take a look at it, see what the subject is, and uh, see if it's important information for you. Not every email m would be pertinent necessarily, but give it a quick look because very often there is something really crucial, something by way of an update that we do want to share with you, uh, and we don't want you to miss anything. So that's my parting recommendation uh, for you this evening. Luke? Thanks. Just a, a warm thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to the FDU family, and we're, we're thrilled to meet with you and can't wait to see you in person. Thanks so much for joining us. My thanks as well, everyone. Perfect. Thank you so much. So with that being said, um, the contact information's on here. You're welcome to get in touch with any of us. Um, and then moving forward, we look forward to seeing you in the fall. Thank you all so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Right. Good night, everybody. Thank Good night. you. Good night. 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 Good night.